Um, up next, we have Ian Dees, who, amongst other contributions to our community, uh, has helped raise the utility kill quotient yesterday. It was one of two. Um, and for some reason, he decided not to wear his kilt while talking. I think there might be some cartwheels, so that is maybe a good thing, maybe not. Either way, Ian Deeks. So that's why we do this, right? 
And all these sort of, sorts of questions, why Ruby, why this talk, why bother, why, why, I feel like these questions are leading somewhere. And so I thought back uh, to this great little essay I read when it came out back in 2004. And uh, has, has anyone read Wearing Ruby Slippers to Work, the old essay by Why the Lucky Stiff? Uh, so this was at a, a newer time for Ruby. Fewer people had heard of it, uh, especially in you know, the enterprise. And uh, so this was a way of, of sneaking Ruby in to keep yourself happy and motivated and sane in your job. And he was going at this from the point of view of like grepping through log files and doing little blue code tasks. And Ruby's fantastic with that kind of stuff, but we're not stuck there anymore, right? We saw yesterday that Ruby's one of the top, what, top 10, top 20 languages. People have heard of Ruby. Uh, you're not going to get funny looks when you when you say, "Oh yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just use Ruby." For and so now I'd like to move into the more specific portion of the talk and show like four little vignettes of specific things you can do with Ruby to help make your life better at work. And really this is, these are based on things that we've done at work that have just, we needed to do some task and we did it. But what I'm really hoping is that you'll see some library uh, that, in, that I mentioned in passing here that maybe solves some need for you and be able to apply it. So I'll be talking about four different vignettes, one sort of dealing with crusty data formats in a lighthearted way, <coughs> um, another scripting other people's software, whether they know that you are or not, uh, third one, sharing code with coworkers, and the fourth one, sharing code with honest to goodness people who give you dollars and, and want some software. Okay, ready? Let's talk about data formats first. Um, in any big enough company, you're going to be running long enough, you're going to have piles of little ad hoc files where everybody maybe started pasting log results into a file, or everybody started tracking their hours in a file, and it just sort of organically grew up. Or maybe it's a weird file you got from a customer, or something. But there are a lot of times you need to crack open some weird piece of ad hoc data. And Ruby provides great tools for doing that. So I'm going to just sort of make up my own ad hoc format. Has so anybody heard of Task Paper, the uh, to-do list tracker? Yeah, they, they use a plain text format called Task Paper, and I'm going to take everything good out of that format and just talk about a tiny subset out of it, just so we can have something to throw our code example at. So it's just it's a to-do list item as a dash and a space, and then it can contain subtasks, and that'll that'll keep us pretty, plenty busy for the next few minutes. Uh, there are a lot of good tools in Ruby to do this. I'm going to talk about Parslet. The neat thing about Parslet is unlike so many other parsing tools, you don't have to run a generator. You don't have to write your grammar in some other format and then generate your final Ruby or C or whatever code. You just express your grammar right there in Ruby. And uh, Parslet will give you sort of arrays and hash tables representing the structure of your document. So just as an example, here's one task, the input line here in the middle, and we expect it to come out with a task called task and, and a tag here. And I'm using mini tests, by the way, because we're in Seattle. <laughs> and uh, so here is the rule that satisfies that. I've, I've copied the task up here. So we can see a task starts with a beginning of task marker. It has a description and then maybe some tags. And in parcel, you just say exactly that. A beginning of task marker, a description, and maybe some tags. And now we have to define those rules. Uh, now if we had lots more room and space, we might actually write little unit tests for each one of these. I'm not going to bother today. These are kind of the basic building blocks of the task format, so we don't really have to drill down much further. right? You can, I just want to point out in parts that you can match exact strings, you can match regexes, you can specify how many times something is allowed to repeat. And now we just have to drill down and flush out that tags rule. So a tag is a beginning of tag marker, one or more tag characters, and then a space. And the, the other nice thing is you can call these rules individually. So when you're writing your unit tests, if I want to test just the, the code that formats that recognizes a tag, I don't have to construct an entire valid to-do list document. I can just have it say at tag, and I can call just that rule for my, my test. It's very nice for getting off the ground and running.
But anyway, that's enough to get our test passing, so yay. Uh, the only thing left to take care of is subtasks. So we'll do that real quick. Here's another mini test test. Here's that same to-do list from earlier. And here's the structure we'd expect. So this one's a little more interesting, right? We've got two big, three, sorry, three top level tasks. And the first one has some subtasks. And Parcel, it comes with some stuff where you can take this format and automatically turn it into Ruby classes that you define. So you might write a task class or a tag class or whatever. And uh, we're not gonna get into that today, but you don't have to stop once it's in this first representation. Uh, anyway, we'll throw our assertion down at the bottom here, and this is all the code we need to make that pass. And the only thing I'll point out is that a, a rule can be a function, kind of like an active record where you can have a scope or you can have a scope defined by a, a, a method on the class. So these are just recognizing a line that's been indented over by a certain amount because it's got a certain number of spaces, and then finally a task and see this as block here, this is what sets the keys in the hash table. You, you tag all the, the parts are, that are important with this as and a, and a name, parcel it throws away everything else, all the punctuation. Um, and now we're test pass, we can move on to the next vignette. Yeah. Scripting other people's software, whether they know it or not. So this is based on a little bit of a horror story. We were asked to support a format from a, from a vendor, like, hey, It'd be really great if you guys could support XYZ format. And of course, the only program on earth that could understand that format, bless you, was the vendor's application package. There was no spec. Uh, it was an obscure binary format. Uh, there was no API. We couldn't grab hold of some automation interface. So what are we left to do? We can say no. We can try to reverse engineer the API by you know, dumping the binaries. Or we can say, you know what, let's just drive this thing through the GUI. And for something really quick and dirty, something uh, with the right half of the ass, <laughs> then uh, you know, driving something to the UI it might be just fine. Uh, I'm just going to, rather than shame the vendor, I'm, I'm just going to write like a PNG to black and white bitmap converter, which works by driving Microsoft Paint a pixel at a time. <laughs> um, this will just let us show how to use um, a couple of libraries. One is Chunky PNG. To, it does some basic image processing and it's, it's pure Ruby, so if you're deploying, you don't have to worry about binary gems and all that stuff. So here's how we would slurp a PNG in, and there are better ways to do this, but we're just going to loop through all the points and say if it's darker than a certain amount, throw it in our list of coordinates of dark places. Do I like that? And then to actually grab hold of the user interface, this will be a Windows program. So we're going to use FFI, which is a foreign function interface, right, allowing Ruby to call in C code. <coughs> this started in the Rubinius project. Um, the JRuby people adopted it. Uh, it's also a Ruby gem, so you can get it in MRI and uh, you know, 1819. Which means that uh, if you need to call some C code, you can write some Ruby code and have it work across four different current popular Ruby implementations, which is, which is kind of cool. And the way it works, we only need two Windows API functions for this, thank goodness. They're called set cursor pos and mouse event. And if you know their C signatures, you can declare those C signatures here in Ruby. You can see this vaguely looks like a C function signature, except the return type is at the end. And you have to tell, okay, what object module do these live in? They live in user32.dll. And uh, the calling convention is the Pascal calling convention, which Microsoft brazenly calls standard. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so now to call it, to, to click the mouse, you move the mouse to a certain spot, you move the left button down or the left button up, uh, you do the hokey pokey, that's what it's all about. So now we can go through all of those shadow points we retrieved earlier and one by one. Now if we were doing this for real, we would poke around in the user interface and find the actual canvas part of it. But we're just going to assume it's maximized and move over 100 pixels each way to avoid the toolbar and the menu and stuff. Now it turns out there's an even faster way to, to write this code. There's a gem I found actually while writing this presentation. Oh wow, somebody has already done the work of abstracting away mouse clicks and window pointer motion and that kind of stuff. It's called WinGUI. 
And we could throw away those last two uh, slides of FFI code and just find the window that matches this regex and do this stuff. And so the story has a happy ending. Um, we, you know, we got it working. We, we, we had a proof of concept. <laughs> Bonus points for the per first person who got to identify the color of the garment in the original picture. Great. Yes, sir, I award you one internet. <laughs> and so we had this proof of concept in Ruby, and we were able to convert it to C with basically some Emacs macros, which is great. And then you know we were able to convince everybody this is a terrible idea, and throw the whole thing away, but at least we, we proved that we could do it. <laughs> so sharing your code with your coworkers without annoying them too much. So this is about you know you've, you've written that little screen scraper, that little um, Aaron Patterson image cloner, and you want to get it onto somebody else's machine. And it, it, if you're at a big workplace, there's a chance that they might be running maybe Windows or something. <coughs> so you, you can't just count on them having RVM installed and a Ruby interpreter shipping with their system. But if they're coworkers and they don't mind a little bit, you can just hand them the source file and say, here, run this. That used to be, you'd hand them the source file and you go, here, there's one authoritative, just go find the, the, the Windows binary at this site and it just works. Um, and, and then um, suddenly there were two Rubies and, and there were there was the, and then out of that, two different compilers. So if, if you, you know, as long as you were careful not to write incompatible code, you were fine, unless you needed the gem that had C code in it, like the MySQL bindings or no Gary or anything interesting, uh, in which case it had to be compiled with the right compiler for the right Ruby version. They would get big, nasty error dialogues if, uh, <coughs> if there wasn't a perfect match. But now the story's really good because MinGW has one thanks to the efforts of Ruby Slavena and the Ruby installer team. And uh, so now you, you tell the, your coworker, go download this particular Ruby install, and if you need binary gems, you can have them extract the dev kit right over their Ruby, and they say gem install foo, and lo and behold, it goes and compiles the gem if they need to, just like on a real computer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And you still have to worry about dependencies, right? If they're going to compile over here, they've got to get libxml. But it's a solvable problem. It's much better than it used to be. Uh, so another approach, if you don't want to have them run from source, if you press for time, you can just give them an exe that has a Ruby interpreter and your code and all your dependencies in it. And there are a lot of ways to do this. Uh, back in the early 2000s, this guy named Eric Feinstra did a script of, uh, sorry, a series of scripts called uh, tar to Ruby script and Ruby script to exe. I don't know why those weren't combined into one step, but it worked really well. It would take your Ruby code and Ruby and just have a self-extracted exe that would quickly unzip Ruby to a temp directory, run your program, and then clean up. And it's as hacky as it sounds, but you know what? It worked. So the, the modern day version of that is called Okra, the one-click Ruby application. And um, I'd just like to show you how easy it is to create an exe to share with somebody. Let's just pick a guinea pig. Um, I just wanted a simple command line app, something we could throw together real quick. And in a beautiful bit of synchronicity yesterday, uh, Corey told us about uh, Hubot, the, the chat bot. So there's a project called Boom from Zach Holman, and I think this is what Zach Holman uses to stay uh, so alert in uh, the chat room and be able to quickly blast in a picture of someone with a paper crown on their head and an animated JPEG of their lips flapping or whatever. He, he finds these URLs to these really cool pictures and collects them so he can quickly paste them in. Boom is like a multiple clipboard manager, and it works from the command line. And uh, so if we wanted to, and there's a video on it, it's exactly looks like, I guess. And uh, so if you wanted to make a self-contained EXE, all you'd have to do is just make a two-liner that runs Boom, and say, Okra, turn that into an EXE, and out comes your program. And it works. So we talked a little bit about binary gems. My, my favorite solution to the what do I do about the MySQL bindings problem is to use JRuby, uh, because the MySQL bindings are a jar, and I don't have to worry about whether or not they were compiled with the right compiler. And Warbler is a tool that lets you bundle up a Ruby app in a single jar file. And so the, the equivalent of that workflow, we have our boom one-liner, we stick it in the bin directory. We add a gem file. We install, make sure all our gems are installed, we say warble jar, and then out comes 
we have to rename it, but then it outcomes boom.jar, and you can just hand that to somebody, say java.jar, boom.jar, and it just runs. And this is the way I tend to share code with most of my girlfriends. We've all, we've all got the JRE installed on our you know, IT mandated corporate machines, and uh, that makes me happy. All right, so that is sharing code with your coworkers, where you can expect that they are willing to jump through a few hoops, or you can expect that they have you know, the Java runtime installed. What about people out there in the real world? Um, it's probably okay to host an Ogre <coughs> executable and let them download it. You know, there's no official installer or anything, but it works well enough. We have actually done this. We've posted little utilities on our website so that our honest to goodness paying customers can come and do little auxiliary tasks. And behind the scene, it's running Ogre and Ruby, and nobody knows. And all everybody knows is that we provided it quickly, and it works. But if you do want to have a full installer for your program, you could um, take the Ruby installer base that we talked about before and then add some post-installation recipes, right? I want to install Ruby, I need to install this set of gems, I need to put some icons in the start menu, and then I need to put my, my program here. You could do that, but that work has already been done. So at Engineer, I've got this project by Dr. Nick and uh, Wayne Segment, I think, uh, Rails installer, they have done just that. They've taken the Ruby installer and added some recipes for other stuff. So what they've done with that is install Git, Rails, a bunch of gems, the database bindings, the database drivers, etc., etc. And the nice thing is it's all spelled out in recipes, in YAML files, config files, and rake recipes. And it's not too hard to dig in there and just substitute in your own program for those recipes. So hypothetically, what would it take to have a boom installer. And I realize I've been mispronouncing boom this whole time because according to its creator, that's the official way to pronounce it. <laughs> so what would it take to have that? Um, you just go in this file called railsinstaller.yaml and list out the gens you need and take out the ones you don't. You go in the, uh, the support directory that supports the rake tasks and you go to the components and you strip out, unless you want to install Rails and Git alongside, boom, then you would take that stuff out. And uh, the only really nasty part is you open up the, the installer script that uses a thing called Inno Setup, which is an open source installation builder. You kind of grip for Rails and say, okay, do I need to replace Rails with boom in this particular line? And it takes about five minutes. It's really easy. And then licenses and artwork. There's, there's a nice graphic of the Rails installer. You probably want to turn it into some really awesome graphic <laughs> representing the software that you'll be installing. And then once you've done all that, you just say rig package and out it comes. Uh, I haven't posted the code yet because uh, I've been getting slides ready, but sometime during this conference, I will take those steps that I've just done and put them in a branch um, in a fork of uh, a Rails installer. <coughs> so that, this ends the specific portion of the talk. Now we get to do a bit of kind of armchair philosophy and uh, talk about, come back to this idea of playfulness, playfulness at work, and, and why that's important. And uh, I'm going to prove to you that anyone can cherry pick a couple of relevant anecdotes from brain science and you know, kind of <laughs> prove anything to anyone and make us all feel good about ourselves for using Ruby. So I'm going to do that now. <laughs> there are a couple of interesting uh, TED Talks on the role of playfulness in the mind and in the team. So uh, one of those is by Stuart Brown. You can, you can just search for it on their website. And he talks about the, the way play affects the brain. The way he says, he says, play lights up the brain in, in, a, in a way that's unlike anything else. And I, I hope in a good way. I don't know if they've actually studied this and found out that it's a good thing, but and he goes up there on into the neurology of it, and it's really interesting. It's a good watch. And the other one is a probably unrelated guy named Tim Brown, and he comes at it from the other angle of teams and organizations. Uh, I, I think he's got some connection to IDEO, the, uh, the industrial design company, and he talks a lot about the results they get as a team when people are encouraged to play. And we're not talking about just you know, lame like trust fall exercises and stuff. We're talking about going about our entire jobs in a playful way. And so I'll leave those there. Another thing I'll mention, I, I found this book. It, it quite surprised me. Oh, yeah. first drawing on the right side of the brain. I had this on, on LP, believe it or not. My parents had this audio book on vinyl uh, back in like, the 80s. 
Um, it's called Drawing to the Right Side of the Brain. And uh, it was about how you've got this sort of parallel processor in your head that can help you deliver incredible results if you can just figure out how to talk to it. Because it doesn't talk in linear, sequential ways. Uh, you know, people don't call it the right brain anymore. That's what they called it back in the 80s, hence the title. But play feeds into that whole idea that we need play. We need play to do our jobs better. It's not just about staying happy. It's not just about saying, you know, we got to keep ourselves challenged and motivated. It's also about doing better work. It's about unlocking that part of our brain that could just make us really deliver it. And then finally, this other book quite surprised me. I hate people. <laughs> this, this is an airport reading book, right? I, I picked this up expecting, you know, $10 worth of entertainment on, on, on a plane flight. Totally got that. Totally worth the ten bucks. Um, I expected it to be like Dilbert in real life, because uh, that's kind of what the the title leads us to believe. Like, here's the chapter on how to deal with, you know, the guy who steamrollers all of your ideas. Here's the chapter on how to deal with the guy that talks too much. Oh wait, that's me. Here's the chapter on how to deal with, you know, this jerk. And it, the first half of the book was kind of like that, but then the book actually got really good after that. Uh, it, it was this kind of Randy Pausch style head fake, where you think the book's going to be about this, and then it veers off into um, how to deliver great results in a big giant organization, or a tiny one, or a dysfunctional one, or wherever you are. Uh, and the authors talk about the idea of being a soloist, so uh, like, like an expert at your craft, uh, not necessarily working alone, but working with a carefully chosen ensemble of like-minded people. And uh, that kind of brings us uh, full circle back around uh, to Cascadia, because here we are in a, in a close inner circle, reaching out to our, our friends as a kind of support group to help keep each other motivated and sane and productive and brilliant uh, over the months to come. And that's my hope for this conference and for us together, is that, that Cascadia RubyConf doesn't end here. Uh, not least because lunch is next, and I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> but also that, that beyond the, this weekend, that we find each other, that we continue to, to, to push each other, to do great things, uh, to use Ruby in wacky ways that stretch our brain, and therefore coincidentally make us do our jobs better, and we have more fun. And I would just like to close with that thought. So long live Cascadia RubyConf, and cheers everybody. <laughs>